Okay, may I say happy Sabbath to everyone? May I say happy Sabbath to everyone? Yes. Wonderful. I am delighted to be here this season. I want to thank my friend, Pastor Sadler, for inviting me to be at your camp meeting this season. Had a beautiful flight over last night. And the Lord has been good. My wife has asked me to convey greetings to you, Pastor, and to the rest of the hosts who know her. And I thought I would share with, let you see a little of what my family looks like. That's my family, my little family. That's my wife uh, on this side here, and our two daughters. That's Kimberly, uh, our first daughter, and that's Dion. And of course, you know, that's me and my wife, all right? So that's my little family, and they all send their greetings and their love, and uh, their prayers are with you and also with me this season. I'm going to be talking about a very interesting s subject for um, the four presentations that I'll be doing. What I'm going to be doing tonight, I'm going to do my very best to move as rapidly as possible. We have a lot, of lot to cover, but no problem. We can always, you know, do some picking up here and there. The theme of the s presentation is who, self, or Christ. And I really believe that that is the a core issue in our whole Christian experience. And as we go through it, I'd like you to really, uh, first of all, understand, I'm going to do, in, I'm gonna, I'll be doing two things. I'm going to be pr doing a little teaching, and I'm going to be also doing a little preaching. So please work with me closely. We're going to be sharing some very, very important information on the subject. Let's just kneel and pray again before we begin. Our loving Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together as your people we have come to this camp meeting to be instructed, to be counseled, to fellowship, and to get closer to you. We ask that the Holy Spirit, the divine teacher that Jesus promised that when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide us into all truth. We pray that he will be our teacher at this time. As I commit myself into thy hands and tell you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, <clears throat> I want to begin by saying that the great challenge that faces uh, every Christian is to constantly choose either self or Christ as master of his or her life. And I believe you'll all agree with me on that. We have every day a choice to make, every single day. Either we're going to serve Jesus, we're going to choose him as our Lord and master, or we're going to choose ourselves and please ourselves. This is our basic, basic uh, Christian doctrine that you know, and I'm going to put it within a framework so that you can understand exactly what the Lord is saying to each one of us. All right. Now, the, the basic philosophy which governs the world is selfishness, which is displayed in self-recognition, self-exaltation, and self-esteem. Now, what I'm going to be addressing is the last one, this, this guy here called self-esteem. Because for many of us who have gone through school, whatever, whether it be college or university or just whatever, we have come across this, this um, word self-esteem, and we have adopted it even into our teachings and in our philosophies without really understanding what we're dealing with. So... What I'm going to be dealing with, not only tonight, but for the three or four presentations I'll be making, is to really unpack this, this word and to open your understanding to what it really means and how it, I, it is negatively affecting our spiritual growth and is destroying the very fabric of our relationship with each other and our relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'd like you to walk with me closely. Now, this philosophy is uh, promoted, talking about self-esteem, is promoted 
in various ways. For example, uh, we, I'm sure you all have heard of Frank Sinatra. Now, Frank Sinatra sang in the year 1969. He said, I did it my way. All right? Now, he did, he, he did but this guy also, Elvis Presley, uh, he borrowed from Sinatra's song in his quest um, to change the stream of thinking of Americans and those around the world when he said, I did it my way. That my way issue is what's causing a lot of problems for us. Now, to, to, to go after the young people so that they can understand that they are also a part of this my way situation, this guy, Nathaniel, sung this pop song. His song was, do what you want to do, be what you want to be. Now, is that the Christian philosophy? No. All right. So follow me closely. Now, this group, this uh, rock band, uh, American rock band, Leonard Skinner, they call themselves, they said, follow your heart and uh, nothing else. Now, how if we were to follow that <laughs> principle, the Bible tells us about the condition of our hearts. Okay? But this group is saying, follow your heart, this rock group. Follow your heart and nothing else. All right. Now, Shirley MacLaine, <coughs> and I'm sure many of us have heard of Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine, in the film Out on a Limb, uh, was encouraged by her Buddhist friend to say, and listen to what he told her to say, uh, the kingdom of heaven is within. I love myself. I am God. She was reluctant to say it, so her Buddhist friend David said to her, See? How low you think of yourself, you can't even say the words. She then said, I am God. And I remember looking at a film where she stood up at the on the seashore and she stretched out her, ha her hands like this and she says, I am God. I am God. It's a philosophy. It's a teaching that is going on and that is per has permeated society taking over our world and doing all kinds of things to the minds of people. But the fact of the matter is, it's affecting the Christian community. And that's really what I'm concerned about, and I want to share with you also. All right. Now, Universalist Unitarianism, uh, a, 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 a philosophy that also is in the world, it says every, every one man chooses what he wants to believe Religious authority lies not in a book or creed or religion, but in ourselves. Wow. Tremendous, isn't it? All right. Let's go a little further. We all have heard of secular humanism. And I have an entire presentation on this. I'm, I'm not sure if we'll be able to, because I have quite a few um, in this series. But if we get onto it, I will broaden out on secular humanism. But just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, secular humanism is man-centered philosophy that excludes God. And by the way, what's happening like in America and uh, many of these um, cities around the world is that they, are be they have been taken over by secular humanism. Completely. All right? So secular humanism says there is no belief in a supreme being. Primary belief, everything so revolves around man rather than God. And this secular humanism is embedded, it has at its foundation this concept of self-esteem. All right. Alistair Crowley, I'm sure we heard of him. All right. He is, as we know, an occultist, um, directed by, the, uh, the, uh, while he was alive, he was directed by Satan himself. His famous quote is, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Now, these guys that I've already um, mentioned, they got that st statement from this guy. But he wasn't the one, the one who made that first. Uh, the first one who made a statement. Let me tell you who was the one who made the first statement. Saint Augustine of Hippo is known to be the one who first made this famous quote. He is known to have said, "Love and do what thou wilt." The focus on the 
person, the self, to the exclusion of Jesus Christ. <coughs> it is quite evident, brothers and sisters, that uh, this worldly philosophy, self-esteem, has slowly crept into the Christian church and has become the driving force behind most, if not everything, that many Christians do. Many of the spiritual maladies that the church has suffered and is now suffering are as a result of this deadly philosophy. You know, Ellen White made a statement. I don't have it in on my document here, but she made a statement that nine-tenths of the problems that our church faces is a result of self-esteem. Dangerous philosophy. All right. Let's say it's known for time's sake. Now, the doctrine of self-esteem is the core principle that propels the world. The Bible tells us that this will be one of the signs of the end of the world. And that's what um, Paul, writing to Timothy, says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. He says, For men shall be lovers of their what? own selves. Then he says they'll be boasters and they will be proud, lovers of themselves. Everything will be centered around self, the uplifting of self, the pleasing of self, to the exclusion of anything that pertains to pleasing Jesus Christ. Now let me give you a brief history of uh, um, self-esteem. Now, this psychologist, um, William James, they are... He lived around, you know, 1842 to 1910. I'll get back to that uh, just momentarily. He was, he was born in New York City and was the older brother of Henry James, uh, the famous novelist. He was trained at Harvard as a physician, although he never practiced medicine, and later taught physiology and eventually philosophy at Harvard. Dr. James is the one credited for craft and the phrase self-esteem, and he is responsible for the upstart of what is known as the self-esteem movement, this guy here. Now keep him, keep him in mind, because I'm going to come back to him um, um, later on, just briefly. Now, <coughs> I want to just share with you also something as we go along. Now, Dr. James' original formula for self-esteem is this, pretensions and then success. No, those are two words that he used carefully. Now, the two elements, feeling good about ourselves, that's pretensions, and how well we actually do success are inextricably linked, according to Dr. James. We can feel better about ourselves by succeeding in the world, but also by varying the levels of our hopes and expectations. Now, just follow closely. Don't get discouraged what is going on. We're gonna ex it's going to be clear to you uh, as we go along. Now, William James, in his pivotal work, that book called The Principles of Psychology, it was published in 1890, defines self-esteem as the feeling of self-worth that derives from the ratio of our actual successes to our pr um, pr pretensions. By pretensions, he meant our estimations of our potential successes, and this is informed by our values, goals, and aspirations. The def pardon me, this definition of self-esteem highlights, brothers and sisters, that it is a construct which addresses the way we evaluate. Now, notice what he says. It's the way we evaluate ourselves and measure our own sense of, what's that word there, self-worth, by comparing how we are and how we aspire to be. All right. Now, let's go on to define even a little more. Now, self-esteem defined. Now, these two guys, Todd um, F. Heatherton and Carrie L. Whelan, wrote an article entitled, Assessing Self-Esteem and in this article, they provided two basic but important definitions of self-esteem. 
Now, what they're going to do is also they're going to bring together in their argument uh, some of the definitions of some prominent uh, psychologists throughout the ages uh, to give an understanding. <coughs> They state accordingly that self-esteem is the evaluative aspect of the self-concept that uh, corresponds to an overall view of the self as worthy of, pardon me, of wor as worthy or unworthy, and that's one of the persons that they have um, pulled. Um, um, this is embodied in Copper Smith's 1967 classic definition of self-esteem, which is the evaluation which the individual makes and customarily maintains with regard to himself. Now keep in mind what's going on here. It expresses an attitude of approval and indicates the extent to, to which an individual believes himself to be capable, significant, successful, and worthy. In short, self-esteem is a personal judgment of uh, the worthiness that is expressed in the attitudes that the individual holds towards himself. Now, follow what I'm going to read from this point onward. Thus, thus these people say, self-esteem is what is that word there? Is what? I didn't hear. Is what? Now, keep in mind, if I ask you to say something after me, I want to hear you shout it out, okay? All right, so self, self-esteem is, what's that word there I, I bold up? It is an attitude. Keep that in mind. It's an attitude about the self and is related to personal beliefs about skill, abilities, social relationship, and uh, future outcomes. And that's the reason why many times you see people operate the way they do. Because of the fact that it's an attitudinal issue we're talking about here. People feel a certain way. Now, <coughs> let's go on a little further. Now, what I'd like to, as we climb the ladder, note carefully that the emphasis in this self-esteem doctrine is self. What's the emphasis? Self. self. It's all-inclusive nature as well as philosophy centers in me, myself, and I. Studies have revealed that self-esteem is positively associated with narcissism or what is known as self-love. Okay? All right. Now, Dr. Larry Day, who is a Christian counselor and a trained pastor, in his book, Self-Esteem by God's Design and in God's Image, page 24 and 25, the 1994 edition, he wrote, and I'd like you to carefully follow what this man said. Now, keep in mind what I just said. He is a Christian counselor, and that's why even when we are going to Christian counselors, we have to be very careful who we go to. All right? The fact that uh, the label Christian is there doesn't necessarily mean that person is connected to God. All right. He says, people talk about self-esteem in a lot of different ways. And listen to the words that he's going to use as he breaks this thing down. He says words like self-image. You have heard that before. Am I right? Am I right? Okay. Self-image, self-concept, self-identity, self-worth. Ah, this is the one we have heard this oftentimes, self-worth. Self, what's that? Respect. And self-esteem have been used interchangeably. Keep that's what he says. Yet each can carry a distinct meaning. When I use the word self-esteem, he says, I think of a core felt belief that is uh, formed in our hearts about the worth of our personhood. All right. Dr. Day states, to help us appreciate the richness of the word esteem, let's look at the list of synonyms that he um, used. Follow me. To value. 
he says. That's the word ST means to value, to prize, to hold dear, to honor, to respect, to think highly of, to love. He used these as synonyms, but let me attach something to each one of them. To value, to value self, to prize, to hold dear, to honor, to respect, to think highly, and to love. Now, now keep in mind, some of just looking at these as faith value may not be bad, but let's go on. All right. Synonyms continue to appreciate to cherish, to treasure, to admire, to like, to be fond of, to care for someone or something. Then, listen, so we're going with the same principle, to appreciate self, to cherish self, to treasure self, to admire self, admire self, to like Self? How many of you admire yourself? How many of you treasure yourself? Mm, yeah. Spend a good half an hour in the, d in the morning looking at yourself and smiling. <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> yes. And to be fond of self. Now, interestingly enough, uh, these things uh, have caused people to believe that it is okay for us to magnify ourselves. And so we have a wrong concept of what it really means. And some people say that self-esteem and self-respect are synonymous. Now, I'm going to break it down for you to let you know it is not so. Now, let's go a little further. This guy says it very plain, and I'd like to share it for with you what he says about self-esteem. He says, uh, self-esteem can also be considered as, and he's this is what he says, Carnal self-love, which is when a man loves himself above God, in opposition to God, with a contempt of God. When our thoughts, affections, desires centers only in our own fleshly interests and rifle God of his honor to make a present of it to ourselves, thus the natural self-love in itself good becomes criminal by the excess when it would be superior and not subordinate to God. Tremendous, that's very tremendous saying it plainly. Very saying it plainly what this thing is all about. And I'm sure many of us would, would have thought that, well, you know, my professor told me that I must have self-esteem. And our youngsters in pr our school, whether it be uh, primary or, or, or secondary or whatever, I, well, I don't know what they call it over here, they, uh, teachers will tell the children, you need to have, you, you have self-esteem. And so what, what we have come to believe is that self-esteem and self-respect mean the same thing. All right. Now, the doctrine of self-esteem is a teaching which is totally opposite to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, I think, uh, even though we're working with time, I, I, I just want to quickly stop and say this to, to us. A lot of what I'm going to say, you're not going to be comfortable with it. Believe me. Because it's going to go against a lot of what we believe or, or how we feel. Now, my intention is not even to hurt anyone at all or to make people feel bad. I'm just presenting some truths that are very significant for us to understand as Christians so that we can know how to relate ourselves to Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right. That's basically my... All right. Now, two main areas of self-esteem. One, high or positive self-esteem and low or negative self-esteem. And if you have done anything about psychology, you'd have had to touch some of these things. All right, let's um, quickly look at them. 
Let's look at some basic characteristics of high self-esteem individuals. Now, as I go through these things, please keep them in mind because we're going to meet them again in another context. All right. Number one, basic characteristics of high self-esteem individuals. This is what the, the psychologists, they say. One, people are considered to be um, psychologically happy and healthy. Two, they feel good about themselves. They are able to cope effectively with challenges and negative feedback. Three, they live in a social world in which they believe that people value and respect them. Four, dismiss or they dismiss negative feedbacks as unreliable or bias. Number five, trivialize the failures or attribute them to external causes. Simply put, they don't want to take responsibility. All right. Number six, the less personal responsibility for harmful um, actions and develop an inaccurate self-concept in their growth and change. Number seven, become angry and aggressive towards those who threaten their ego. Eight, engage in downward social comparisons, a process that underlies prejudice and discrimination. Number nine, the motivation to protect feelings of self-worth can also lead to a rigid, closed mindset that cannot tolerate alternative viewpoints known as need for cognitive closure. Okay, number ten, sometimes engage in dysfunctional behavior. And number 11, inflated ego is easily pricked and insensibly need for social approval often leads to relationship problems. So people oftentimes with high self-esteem, they have marital problems as well as other serious issues. Now basic uh, characteristics of low self-esteem individuals. Number one, individuals believed to be psychologically dis um, distressed and uh, perhaps even depressed. Number two, they see the world through a more negative viewpoint. And number three, their, their general dislike for themselves color their perceptions of everything around them. Now, you may be wondering why am I telling you all of this. As we go along, you will see and in this message and in the, the ones coming up. Very, very important. Now, low self-esteem is as diabolical as high people with high self-esteem. In one sense, low self-esteem is the opposite of pride. What are we saying? In another sense, low self-esteem is a form of pride. Some people have low self-esteem because they want people to feel sorry for them, to pay attention to them, to comfort them. Low self-esteem can be a declaration of, look at me just as much as a pride. In other words, calling attention to the person, to the self. It simply takes a different route to get to the same destination, that is self-absorption, self-obsession, and selfishness. Low self-esteem. All right? Now, self-esteem and self-respect contrast. I said I will touch on to that, so let's see what we're talking about. They're not the same thing. So let's see if we can clear that up as we move along. Self-esteem has to do with the promoting of the self or the person. Its main focus is uplifting oneself over and above everyone else. Self is the idol. Self is always number one. Now Webster defines self-esteem as the holding of a good opinion of oneself. And Webster also um, tends to present self-esteem as a, a synonym of self-respect, or self-respect as a synonym of um, self-esteem. Uh, he also says, Webster also says that self-esteem has to do with self-conceit. Now let's see what self-conceit is. According to self-esteem, according to Webster, is an overwhelming opinion of one's own powers, endowment, merit, or the likes. It's vanity. Now, I don't know if you have ever 
um, been talking to some people, or every time you talk to these people, they, 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 they don't get into the argument or the conversation with you for two minutes without having to say something about themselves, and they just cannot help talk about themselves and themselves and themselves. All right? That is what we're talking about when we talk about self-esteem and self-conceit. Now, self-respect has to do with the proper respect for oneself or one's own character. That's self-respect. Self-esteem, according to another dictionary, Funk and Wagner, a good opinion of oneself and overestimation of oneself. It is giving the eye on due prominence in speech and in action. Synonyms are egotism, pride, self-conceit, self-confidence, self-assertion, self-exaltation. Exalting what? Oneself. Now, just for time, let me just jump on to that, what the other guy said. I could tell it to you another time. Let me tell you what Ellen White says. Ellen White says of self-respect, she says, the word of God forbids our attaching undue importance to our works, but it nowhere forbids self-respect. There is, she says, a conscious dignity of character which is not pride or self-esteem. Notice what she says. But, it, but is the safeguard of youth. He is impressed that he has a reputation to sustain, a character to lose or to keep. In God's inspired book, you will have a faultless instructor, an unhearing counselor, and unfailing guide. Ellen White says that in Manuscript Release, Volume 18, page 259. So self-respect and self-esteem are two different things. Completely different thing. So I would like to establish that as we move along so that we can know what we are talking about. And that God expects us to have self-respect, but not self-esteem. All right. Now this fellow here, said Bob, Mr. Bob Cock, he says, Our business in life is not to get ahead of others but to get ahead of ourselves. That's our business in life. What really is the business of most people today? The business of most people today is to get ahead of others. We do it and we don't care how we do it as long as we get ahead. In corporate America and other places, that's what it's all about, getting ahead of people. And it doesn't really matter what path we take, even if people are hurt or destroyed, we really don't care as long as we get ahead. So this man's counsel is very, very beautiful. We should try to get ahead of ourselves. Now the Holy Scripture teaches us, uh, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but uh, in lowliness of mind, I'd like you to read the rest with me, everybody. In lowliness of mind, what should we do? Let, in lowliness of mind, let what? What's that word there? That word there is esteem what? Others, how? Better than what? Themselves. Philippians 2 and verse 3. So according to the philosophy of Jesus Christ, according to the philosophy of the Bible, what we need to do is to esteem others better than ourselves. Are you following me so far? Okay, we need to keep that in mind. We are not called to esteem ourselves. We are called to esteem others better than ourselves. All right. Now, the, the self-esteem movement has its most recent roots in clinical psychology, namely in the personality theories of such men as William James, Alfred Adler, Eric Fromm, Abraham Maslow, and Carl Rogers. And I'm sure for many who are here who have done some kind of study, whether it's in psychology or other, you have come upon these names. And these are reputable names in the field of psychology. And these are names that people study and say, th this is what this one says. And they take these men's theories as laws. And the problem is that we take these things and these teachings that these guys uh, have, have propounded and we bring it into the church 
and we somewhat use their teachings to side away the word of God and to make it sound and appear as though their teaching should be accepted over and above the philosophy of scripture. Now, many people have never studied the lives of some of these guys and know who they are. But some of these guys have nothing to do with God. Now, it became further popularized by their many followers. Nevertheless, the roots of the self-esteem movement reach further back into history. So what I'm going to do now is I want to I'm going to take you on a quick journey before I sit down of the history, the true history of self-esteem, where it all started, and then you will begin to understand, which of course you know. The true origin of self-esteem. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14 tells us, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like what? The most I. I will be like the most I. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 14 to 15 and then verse 17 says thou art the anointed cherub that cover it and I have set thee so thou was upon the holy mountain of God thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. God is explaining the whole situation that happened to Lucifer. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, God said. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. That's the beginning, the true beginning. Now, Walk with me closely as I lay out to you how Ellen White puts it that this thing really happened in heaven. Follow me closely. Ellen White tells us how this evil was developed. How is it that a being that was so holy, a being that was so righteous, a being that was so beautiful, ended up becoming the devil? evil. She says, little by little, Lucifer came to indulge what? I just heard about two or three people saying that to me. She says, little by little, Lucifer came to indulge, what did he came to indulge? The desire for what? That's it. Self-exaltation has to do with self-esteem. All right. He indulged that desire. The scripture says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Thou hast said in thine heart, or in thy mind, God is saying, Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high. Now that's a creature talking. Though all his glory, Ellen White says, was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to what? We got to watch ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we got to watch ourselves. We do not know what's in our heart. Let's continue. She says, not contend, probably content with his position. You know, um, I don't know about some of you, but I can tell you, I've been a pastor for <coughs> about 30 years of my life. 
and having had to deal with church members over the years, I, I really am still under trying to understand why church positions create so many problems in churches. People hate each other because of church positions. Ellen White says, not content with his position. Though honored above the heavenly host, of all the angels that were in heaven, he was the highest one. But he still wasn't happy. He was the guardian of God's throne. But he still was not happy. He wanted something. Because the moment he started cherishing the spirit of self-exaltation, something began to happen to his mind. Is there anyone here tonight that is not happy with your position? I should have been. Let me ask none for time's sake. He ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. Notice how often that self is coming up. And coveting the glory which Sorry, with which the infinite father had invested his son, this prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Coveted. That's Patriots and Prophet, page 35. Let's hear, uh, let me ask you this. What was Lucifer's real subject which caused the rebellion in heaven? Have you, given, have you ever given thought of that? What is this real, what is the real subject? Listen to what Ellen White says. Ellen White says, he left the immediate presence of the Father, dissatisfied and filled with envy against Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? The one who made him. Concealing his real purposes, he assembled the angelic host. He introduced his subject, which was what? Mm -hmm. As one aggrieved, he related the preference God had given Jesus to the neglect of himself. Mm -hmm. He told them that henceforth all the sweet liberties the angels had enjoyed was at an end. For had not a ruler been appointed over them, to whom they from henceforth must yield servile honor? He stated to them that he had called them together to assure them that he no longer would submit to this invasion of his rights and theirs. How often we in church fight over our rights? Now, a statement is in my mind that Ellen White says that Jesus never contended for his rights. How often do we contend for our rights, even our homes? Sometimes our, 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 our homes are unhappy because somebody is always contending for their rights. Mm. That never would he again bow down to Christ. That he would take upon, sorry, take the honor upon himself, hmm, which should have been conferred upon him. Didn't get it freely, so he's going to do it by force. And would be the commander of all who would submit to follow him and obey his voice. Sincere and loving appeals were made to Lucifer. And why it tells us that angels that were loyal and true sought to reconcile this mighty rebellious angel to the will of his creator. 
they anxiously sought to move Satan to renounce his wicked design and yield submission to their creator. For all had henceforth been peace and harmony, and what could occasion this dissenting rebellious voice? And why it says Satan refused to listen. Are you a person like that? That when you are wrong and someone tries to talk to you, you are not willing to listen. I don't want to hear. Spirit of self esteem. And then he turned from the loyal and true angels, denouncing them as slaves. Again, the loyal angels warned Satan and assured him that what must be the consequence if he persists. That he who could create the angels could by his power overturn all their authority and in some signal manner punish their audacity and terrible rebellion. The mighty revolter then declared that he was acquainted with God's law. So he is not a fool. He knows what he's talking about. And if he should submit to servile obedience, his honor would be taken from him. See the problem? Is having now it says all heaven had rejoiced to reflect the Creator's glory and to show forth His praise. And while God was thus honored, all had been peace and gladness. But a note of discord now marred the celestial harmonies. The service and exaltation of self. Keep that in mind. The service and the exaltation of self, contrary to the, to the Creator's plan. Awaken forebodings of mind, sorry, of evils in the minds to whom God's glory was supreme. The heavenly council pleaded with Lucifer, the Son of God, presented before him the greatness, the goodness, and the justice of the Creator and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his maker and bring ruin upon himself. Because when God made, when God made it, the angels and set up the, his, his, his kingdom, God made it that self should not be prominent. God made it that the service of love should be the motivating factor. That's what God did. But Ellen White says the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. Lucifer allowed jealousy of Christ to prevail and he became the more determined. When self, brothers and sisters, when self takes us over, we are in serious trouble. Ellen White tells us pride in his own glory nourished the desire for supremacy. The high honors conferred upon Lucifer were not appreciated as the gift of God and called forth no gratitude to the Creator. He gloried in his own brightness and exaltation and aspired to be equal with God. He was beloved and reverenced by the heavenly host. Angels delighted to execute his command and he was clothed with wisdom and glory above them all. He was the highest angel in heaven. He was regarded with, the, with respect above every other angel. But something took all of him. The spirit of self-esteem. Let me hasten on to a close. And why says he sought to, to create sympathy for himself. And sometimes we have got to be careful when we see people coming around us and talking things to create sympathy for themselves. Many problems that have occurred in the churches started with the same spirit that Lucifer demonstrated. I'm not being treated right. He sought to create sympathy for himself by representing that God had dealt unjustly with him in bestowing supreme honor upon Christ. He claimed that in aspiring to greater power and honor, he was not aiming at self-exaltation. That's what he's saying. The very same thing that he's going after, but was seeking to secure liberty for all the inhabitants of heaven 
that by this means they might attain to a higher state of existence. So in other words, even though, as we have seen before, that his subject was himself, yet when he is talking, according to what NY says, as he addressed the angels, he's letting them know that I'm not, I'm not about, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about all of you. You are being treated like a slave and you are not being treated right and God's not treating you right and I'm here as the only voice to talk to them about the issue. When in truth and in fact, Lucifer knew from the very get-go that the issue was about himself. And why it says, God in his great mercy bore long with Lucifer. He was not immediately disregarded, this, um, degraded from his exalted station when he first indulged the spirit of discontent, nor e even when he began to present his false claims before the loyal angels. Notice what Ellen White says, his false claims. Long was he retained in heaven again and again. He was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. But, what's that word there? But what? Pride. But what? Now, let me ask you, do you cherish pride? You know, many problems could be solved in our homes, in our personal lives, in our marriage lives, in the church. Many problems that have become a mountain could have been solved easily if that word did not exist. Pride. Pride. Dangerous word. But pride... Forbade him to submit. I'm not going to submit. He persistently defended his own course, maintained that he had no need for repentance, and fully committed himself in the great controversy against his maker. The spirit of self-esteem. The spirit to want to be first. The seer of Patmos records the awful consequence of Lucifer's self-esteem attitude. John was shown a panoramic view by God. As God even showed it to Ellen White. And G John saw what happened after God could bear no longer with Lucifer in heaven. John said, as he wrote in Revelation chapter 12, 7 to 9, And there was war in heaven. War. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. What started it? Self-esteem. The spirit of self-esteem. spirit of pride. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And verse 8 says, And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. You know, a colleague of mine many years ago said to me, that spirit of pride or spirit of arrogance, it never dies. It's a spirit that it may lie dormant for a while, but it never dies. And that's why Lucifer cannot go back to heaven, and he will not be saved. And there was, and the, pardon me, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Brothers and sisters, let me just say this to you before we close. If you, if you cherish self-esteem, because I'm just giving you an introduction to what we're going to talk about tonight. If you cherish self-esteem, you can be absolutely sure that heaven will not be your home. And I'm going to prove that to you before this camp meeting is over. Self-esteem is a devil's sin. Yes, I know what Dr. So-and-so said to you at college or university. You should have self-esteem. It's time for us to discard that word. It is not of God. That's what caused our problem on this earth today. Finally, self-esteem causes human beings to cast their will against the will of God. 
which ultimately allows us to be at war with our maker. So my question to you is, are you at war with your maker, who is also your savior, in your heart? I'm not just talking about mouth talk. You know, I know we say a lot of things, but I'm talking about in your heart tonight, each one of us here tonight, in your heart, are you at war with your maker? Who is your savior? Are you at war? Who is on the throne of your heart? Is it Christ or is it you? There's a question that we will have to answer sooner or later. And I hope that as we deal with these, this topic, this camp meeting, that we will answer that question well to the glory of God, to the saving of our souls. Amen. Let us pray. We have heard your voice tonight, Lord. And you have just started to talk to us. There is so much that you would like to say to us if we will listen. For our minds have been so polluted by false teachings. And it is your desire to change our thoughts. To cause us to look away from self and look to you. My Father, I pray tonight that your words will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you purpose. I pray tonight that for each one of us who are naturally consumed with self and always have that desire to be acknowledged and to be glorified, to be esteemed, Help us, Lord, to die to self. Let us tonight, Lord, step away from the throne of our hearts and allow Jesus to take up his full residence there, that he would rule as Lord and Master of our lives, and that self will be forgotten. Give us, O oh Lord, the grace. Give to that lady, O oh Father, the willingness to submit to you. Give to that man, O oh Lord, who has, had not, who has for years not have had peace in his home and peace in his life. Make that surrender tonight. Let a young person understand that the way of happiness is to allow Jesus to be Lord of their life. Take charge, O oh God, of our lives and help us to walk as you lead us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.